going to talk now, this part of my presentation, about the way the Victorian licensing system works and a bit about our little driving clinic over at St Vincent's, but also there's a few little tales about the legal involvement in this and about the legal significance of driving assessment. Uh, I guess one of, the, one of the risks of my job is that you tend to think like a lawyer after a while, and uh, so I've got to uh, cover a few little issues that you know, we've all got to think about because there is a legal responsibility in the sorts of work we do um, and in the interpretation of the outcomes. So licensing in Australia is um, a, a state responsibility, so you know, there's several different jurisdictions. They've all got different laws. They're basically similar, and there is a push for uniform legislation. I mean, that book of guidelines that you've all got there is actually a, an Australia-wide federal effort, and it's meant to apply everywhere, but there are some little minor uh, differences between various jurisdictions, and you know, for instance, in some states they have compulsory reporting by medical practitioners, and, in some states they have age-based assessments and other various things. But most of the, the regulations are pretty similar. So there are some little minor differences, but obviously I'm going to talk mainly about the Victorian situation. Here in Victoria, Vic Roads is God. Vic Roads is the ultimate organisation that says yes or no. And all of us might give advice to Vic Roads or might send in reports and do assessments and do tests on people. But ultimately, it's Vic Roads that has the final say as to whether or not a person gets a licence, how long they get it for, whether there's any conditions on it, when it needs to be reviewed, uh, and all the rest of the paraphernalia that goes with licensing. There's no specific legislative requirements about impairments. There used to be um, a regulation in Victoria about visual acuity, and, uh, but that's, that's all been lifted now in deference to the national standards. So in fact, there's no legislative regulation regarding impairments. Vic Roads has got discretion about licensing conditions. They have a legislative requirement to satisfy themselves that a person's fit to drive, but there's no law that says what that fitness to drive is. There are the guidelines which have got a certain legal status or otherwise, which I'll talk about in a minute, but ultimately it's up to Vic Roads. And Vic Roads decisions can be subject, well, firstly to internal review if people want to appeal them, uh, and ultimately people have got recourse to the magistrate's court and every year Vic Roads gets a few cases where they've got to go to court and, and, um, and uh, I guess, argue or defend their decisions. There's other authorities that issue different kinds of driving permits. There's the Victorian Taxi Directorate, which has jurisdiction over taxi uh, permits, bus drivers, driving instructors. And there's WorkSafe, which has jurisdiction over um, people who uh, drive dangerous goods, explosives, petrol tankers, things like that. Oddly enough, there's no similar law for people that drive cranes and forklifts and other industrial um, uh, devices like that. There, there used to be years ago, but now it's, it's really up to the employer to be satisfied that a person's fit to operate a crane, and there's no specific law about it, which is sometimes a bit scary, I've got to say. You know, we can see people for instance, at St Vincent's, who've got terrible epilepsy, tell them not to drive a car, but there's nothing to stop them getting a job as a forklift or crane driver. It's pretty, pretty terrifying. So the way the system works is that Vic Roads um, gets a source of information about somebody, and I'll talk in a minute about what that might be. And Vic Roads has a licence review department, which is staffed mainly by clerical people who process this information, but they have several medical case managers that have either nursing or occupational therapy backgrounds that act as a sort of a, a second line referral level inside Vic Roads. When Vic Roads gets um, a notification that somebody might have a medical problem, they, they, they will generally send a form out to that person, say, go and get a medical review, go and get a medical opinion from your doctor or a report, send it back to us, you've got X amount of time to do that, and then they will make a decision based on the medical report that they get about a person's fitness to drive. If they um, find that it's a quite an, an easy, straightforward decision, that's fine. There's a set of guidelines that Vic Roads has internally based on the book um, that their internal review people use. If it's a, a difficult case or a, a complicated case or there's multiple conditions or certain difficult conditions, they will send it to us at the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine where we review um, cases in file form for Vic Roads and send them back written opinions or advice about things. And we also have an expert committee, of which a bit more later. And uh, once that opinion gets back to Vic Roads, Vic Roads makes a decision. 
and then the driver, if they've been knocked back, obviously has a, um, an avenue to uh, ask for a review or appeal. The sources of information that VicRoads have are many and varied. There's no compulsory age-based review in Victoria, but uh, once a person um, becomes known to VicRoads Medical Review, then they get into the review system, and they may or may not need to have regular reviews after that. Um, one, one source of information is on the initial application form, so people apply for a learner's permit or for a licence, and there's a question, well, there's a series of questions on those forms asking about medical conditions, certain specific conditions like epilepsy and diabetes, etc., whether they're taking any medication um, and things of that sort. So those things, if they're disclosed on application form, they then lead to an automatic medical review. VicRoads gets an enormous number of notifications from the police. Um, if the police turn up at a crash and, uh, you know, they do a breath test on someone and they're satisfied <coughs> that they're not drunk or there's no drugs involved and they think there might have been some issue of impairment, then they will automatically notify VicRoads and so this, the whole same medical review process happens. They also get, um, I guess, dob-ins from various people, doctors, health professionals, family, general public. Sometimes they need to be taken with a bit of a, bit of a grain of salt. One of the things you learn about working in this field is that there's a lot of high emotions concerning driving and, and people will dob people in for all sorts of capricious reasons. I don't think health professionals do that, but certainly next door neighbours and family and anonymous will do that. You, you, you certainly get concerned family, especially with older drivers who will s uh, send notification into VicRoads because they want something done about someone who's obviously uh, got some cognitive problems. There is a bit of law that says that it's compulsory for drivers to report themselves. So there's actually a, a regulation in the Road Safety Act that says that anybody who's got a, a condition that might have a long-term chronic effect on their ability to drive must notify VicRoads of this. And people have gotten into trouble in the courts um, after crashes, etc., who haven't done this. Um, it's, a, it's a contentious issue. There's also Section 27 of the Road Safety Act. That's the section that protects all of us and it says that if a health professional, or in fact if anybody, notifies Vic Rhodes about a driver who's potentially unsafe and does it in good faith, not, not out of sort of spite or anything, but if we do it as part of our normal professional activities, then we can't be sued by the driver. Even if they lose their licence, whatever might happen to them, we can't be sued because we've acted professionally in good faith. This is a, a, pretty, um, a pretty reassuring... Um, bit of law really because there are many cases where doctors and other people will see people and you know who could be dangerous we get lots of phone calls asking about this and I'm sure Vic Rhodes gets even more than we do but there is no compulsory reporting by health professionals so if you or me or anybody sees somebody who is dangerous we don't have to report there's no bit of law that says we have to report um, but I think that we have a moral obligation to do it and I like to talk about the coroner's court test which is, you know, how would you feel in the witness box of the coroner's court if you didn't report and all your notes were there and it said that this person has epilepsy or whatever and you hadn't notified or done anything about it. In all areas of medicine, it's something that I certainly appreciate working in the field of forensic medicine is that information is really, really important and you must keep notes about all this sort of stuff. It's your best protection in the long run if you've had to take action or you've seen someone and there's some disaster down the track, you must keep adequate notes. Uh, ultimately, it's the only thing that'll save your skin, really. So the medical guidelines, a wonderful effort every, every few years to review these and to produce these, but they are not law, they're not legally binding. <coughs> there, have been, there have been court cases in Australia, not in Victoria, but in New South Wales. There was one really well-known court case involving a driver with epilepsy where the legal status of the guidelines was questions in court and there was issues about whether or not this person would get into trouble because their condition fitted into what's in the guidelines or otherwise. Um, so, you know, they're an important document and courts tend to examine documents very intensively and argue about them. So, even though we can depart from what's in these guidelines, they are only guidelines, they're not law, you'll be very careful doing that. And we sometimes do it on, on really, really top quality expert advice, but uh, it's something that should be done very, very carefully and very, very circumspectly because uh, you know, if something nasty happens, courts have a way of inquiring into things in great detail and they will look at these guidelines um, even though they're not part of established law. 
Licensing conditions, um, really, you know, all sorts of conditions can be put onto people's licenses, and VicRoads, of course, has the ultimate say into what those conditions are going to be. Some of them are really easy and straightforward. Someone needs to wear glasses, obviously they have to wear glasses. If they've got a, a condition that uh, results in poor night vision, then they can have a license restricted to daytime only. Automatic transmissions, all those things, re regular reviews are a condition. They can be put on a license. Some of them not so straightforward. And um, you know, we see all sorts of weird and wonderful conditions mooted for people. You know, distances is probably a fair income restriction. But you know, things like restricting people to specific routes or specific streets or just to do left-hand turns, not really very practical. We had one recently where somebody advised that this you know, elderly gentleman could only drive two or three k's and he's saying, but look, there's no petrol station within two or three k's. I'll have to get someone else to take my car to get it filled up. <laughs> so you know, these things have to be practical. They have to be enforceable. So, you know, if a police officer happens to pick up somebody and, you know, interrogates their computer and sees what conditions are on a licence, it's got to be something practical um, uh, that, that, you know, actually will have a positive bearing on, on, on their safety. You know, we've had people say, well, you know, someone can only drive on the roads bounded by page 47B3 of the Melways, etc. And that's also a problem because a driving licence is a legal document that says Vic Roads certifies that this person is fit to use the Victorian road system as it is, warts and all, with roadworks, detours, bad weather, you know, signal breakdowns, signs, all the things that we find on the road. We, Vic Roads are saying that this person who's got this bit of plastic knows how to use that system and is able to deal with the unexpected. Um, and so that's got to be borne in mind when thinking about whether or not a person can have a driver's licence it's not enough just to say, well, they can drive from here to the doctor's surgery or from here to the shops. They've got to be able to deal with the unexpected in case something happens. We've done a lot of work about um, medical reviews and, um, you know, what people do have um, or what sort of uh, medical conditions people do have that actually come to grief. I was fascinated to hear that study that Chris was talking about earlier on today about um, driving assessments for inpatients and the lack of, um, it's certainly something that we are quite familiar with, that there's not much knowledge of doctors out there, whether they're hospital doctors or GPs or specialists even, um, about driving, unless they happen to practice in certain fields where there's a lot of issues with this. So for instance, neurologists to deal with epilepsy will certainly be familiar with it, but you know, other, uh, other specialists might not be, and GPs might not get a Vic Rhodes form very often. You know, they might work in an area where there's not very many older people, and they might get a Vic Rhodes form once a month or once every couple of months, and they don't really have their skills maintained in thinking about driving. So if somebody comes in who's just been diagnosed with diabetes and put an insulin, they don't think instantaneously, well, you know, this is going to be an issue. What we've done over the years, we've done a couple of studies. Uh, because we work in close conjunction with the coroner's court, we've had the opportunity to look through coroner's files from time to time. And um, the first of these studies we did back in 96, where we we um, got all of the coroner's files on people that died behind the wheel who were over the age of 70 over a two year period. What was encouraging about this was that um, these people constituted just over 10% of all the dead drivers in that period. That's about the same as their proportion of the population. So the number of people over 70 are about 10% of the population. They're about 10% of the dead drivers. That was encouraging because it said there's not more of them getting killed than you'd expect. So these people are not getting killed just because they're older. They're getting killed at the same rate as everybody else, which you know, perhaps you can think of as being comfortable. I suppose if we'd done a similar <laughs> study... <laughs> I would like to think that if we'd done a similar study of people between 18 and 25, we'd probably find it was a high proportion. Of those um, 42 drivers that we found, only two of them were actually known to Vic Roads. And what was also encouraging was that neither of those, or actually one of those, uh, died in a collision that was totally somebody else's fault, even though this person had lots and lots of medical problems. Um, none of those had contributed to the crash. The other one was a man who'd been sent a, um, a request for a medical report because they thought because they thought he might be at risk of a stroke because he'd been having transient is ischemic attacks. In fact, he had a stroke before he could get a medical appointment. But the other 40 
weren't known to Vic Roads. And um, what was interesting about looking at coroner's files is that you do get autopsy results, toxicology, you get medical reports from their doctors and all that sort of information. We found of those 42, there were three that killed their spouse. Um, you know, the husband and wife had been driving together. I think they were all male drivers and the female spouse was killed. It's not uncommon in that age group then for only the husband to have a driver's license. And um, this is a powerful argument, we think, against putting a, a condition of having a navigator or having a, a co-pilot for people who have just got early dementia. We don't think that's a protection. We think that just puts the co-pilot at risk. And even though in some countries, like in Canada, they do espouse having co-pilots, we don't believe in it and we don't, we don't let people drive that way. Um, on the autopsies and on the medical reports, there was a high instance of unreported illnesses, in, especially cardiovascular disease. Now, I suppose if you autopsy anybody over the age of 70, you're going to find a degree of cardiovascular disease. So it's hard to know how important it is. But when you looked at their doctor's records, you certainly found that quite a lot of people were on medication and had conditions that should have resulted in a notification to Vic Roads, even though Vic Roads might have let them drive or they might have uh, asked for further information. There were people who'd had heart attacks, people who'd had angina. Um, all of those things would have got Vic Roads to request a bit more information and satisfy themselves about fitness. Uh, but none of these people were known to Vic Roads. There was a lot of prescription drug use that wasn't mentioned on doctor's reports. So people, um, you know, if they come to us and have to have an autopsy, they get toxicology investigations. So we do a very thorough uh, testing for all sorts of uh, drugs and medications and so forth. Uh, caused us a bit of excitement in the, the study we did in 2010, but not in, 2000, uh, but not in 1996. But we found a, a big incidence of um, drugs that weren't known to their doctors or weren't mentioned to their doctors. And you know, whether people are getting them from other doctors, whether they're you know, getting together and someone says, look, I've got this wonderful tablet for my arthritis, why don't you try? <laughs> you can laugh, but I can remember my old mum saying things like that. You know, Mrs. So-and-so is taking this pill, why can't I have it? So you, know, you can imagine them having a bit of a chat about this. Um, so you know, there, there, there are issues of prescription drugs that you know, people might not know are taking. When we re repeated the study in 2010, we got very similar results. We got a couple of fascinating bits of toxicology. We found a couple of old cannabis users. So there are, you know, there's a few oldies that still like to have a bit of a puff. And we found one bloke, we found one old bloke that had some methamphetamine in his blood. And we, we, we got very excited. And then we discovered that it was a metabolic product of a particular drug used for Parkinson's <laughs> disease. <laughs> so. You know, dope fiends don't, don't um, get up that far. But, you know, the bottom line is, though, that there are, there are a lot of medical conditions out there that don't get reported. Um, this then leads us to thinking about, well, you know, what, what are the responsibilities of doctors and can you get into trouble over these sorts of cases? Um, criminal liability of doctors or other health professionals is not covered in the fitness to drive legislation, so that section of the Road Safety Act protects you being, from being sued by the patient or by the driver but doesn't protect you from being charged with something nasty if somebody has a crash. So there is a potential liability if medical advice is found to be negligent um, or if, a, if an OT assessment is found to be improper, for instance, or any other kind of assessment. And there have been civil suits brought against doctors. I don't know about other professionals. There have been civil suits brought for damages. If somebody's been driving, had a crash, damaged somebody else or damaged some property or killed somebody, the other party can, uh, has actually had a go at the doctor for giving that advice, even though the doctor themselves might not have satisfied the criteria for a criminal charge. And this was the case that really you know, got people going on this. This was a case in, two, in 2006 where um, a doctor was threatened with a manslaughter charge over a bus crash where the driver killed himself and a couple of passengers. The driver was told not to drive buses by the doctor but didn't take <laughs> medical advice. In fact, after that, a lot of people stopped giving advice. So here in Victoria, we have an expert committee that works with us at the Institute of um, Professors of Neurology and Ophthalmology that give us advice about this. But in other states, um, I think they have yet to find a way around this problem. We found here in Victoria that collision investigators are going for Vic Rhodes files very frequently, much more so than ever before. And they're starting to wonder about the effects of medical conditions and of the people that have given advice. So it's important to think about this. The Victorian police who investigate crashes are very tough about this sort of stuff. Talked about our role. I just want to talk a little bit about the St Vincent's Clinic. 
Um, we started this up in 2004. It began as a neurology clinic just looking at epilepsy and driving, but it's since been extended to every other condition. So we see diabetics, people with all sorts of acquired disabilities, people with dementia, people with congenital things like muscular dystrophy and so on. It's um, staffed by forensic physicians like me from the Institute and um, we are, we're only really resourced enough to see three or four patients a week. We only do one session a week. We'd love to be able to do more. In fact, we had an offer to set up a clinic at one of the other rehab hospitals in Melbourne where they have OTs on staff, which would have been terrific, but we just haven't got enough resources to do this. Um, in the first couple of years, we saw all sorts of patients from 16 to 91, cars, learner's permits, taxis, heavy vehicles. We only really knock back 3% on the spot. Uh, most of them we assessed as being fit to drive. We don't have this clinic to stop people from driving. We have this clinic to keep people on the road. Uh, we sent about a third of them off for further tests, including OT assessments. A lot of neurology, as you'd expect, but really all sorts of other things as well. Um, I, uh, I guess it's probably even more varied now than it was then. One of our legitimate functions is to give bad news. A lot of doctors will refer, obviously, unfit people to us, saying, look, you know, can you talk to him? I don't want to lose the doctor-patient relationship, and we think that's completely fine to do that. So I guess, you know, the end result is that um, even though all the various individual conditions that everybody here has talked about have all got low relative risks, the prevalence is going to rise as the population ages. Medical issues are of increasing significance. Doctors and other health professionals are going to have to deal with these things and there will be concern about the legal liability of practitioners. It's something for us all to bear in mind. Uh, look, an old recovered stroke in itself, if the person's recovered totally, that's not an ongoing chronic condition that can affect driving. But there's also the consideration of why you had the stroke. And in some cases, if it's known why a person has the stroke, perhaps you know, due to a cardiac condition or you know, something else, then um, that's got to be adequately treated. And I guess the best test is, is he on ongoing medication? Is he being treated for something? If he is, then the safest thing to do is to notify Vic Roads. The issue being that if you don't notify, um, somebody can always raise that question about liability and culpability. The safest thing to do is to notify. Vic Roads might say, fine, go ahead, drive, don't bother us, but at least you've done the right thing. What we have to think about is how that off-road assessment is informing what we're seeing on-road. And the on-road assessment, the on-road um, errors that occur in isolation don't give us an adequate picture of whether this person's safe to drive. Also doesn't give me a good idea about whether they're is potential for remediation or realistic potential for remediation. All of those issues around the recommendations are really coming from the combined information from the off and on-road assessment. So if I just did an on-road assessment and I didn't do the off-road, I wouldn't know why that person ran a red light. But often I can tell you the key features from their off-road assessment that's giving me a good understanding of why it is that they ran that red light at that time in the context of what happened in the environment. So it's not just the errors that are occurring on road. So I can say, yes, they sped 10 times, five kilometres over the limit, but it's, did they do that because they didn't monitor the signs? Did they do that because they've got poor foot control? Did they do that because they're losing attention? Did they do that because a whole host of reasons that could be causing that. What the off-road does is gives us the depth of information to really try and determine why it is that those errors happened and then what the most appropriate course of recommendation is, I suppose. And it really comes down to really around the remediation. So a straight out fail, yes, you could say from the on-road assessment, you would probably say, look, this person is not going to be able to drive because of A, B, C, D and E, but sometimes people just have a really bad day. And I think the off-road assessment gives us really rich data to join those two things together and then make a much more informed recommendation than we would without the value of the off-road assessment. Uh, it's partly to prove that they have a licence, um, but Vic Roads might be privy to other information that I don't have that says that this person um, shouldn't be driving or doesn't meet the medical guidelines to drive that perhaps their GP doesn't even know. So Vic Roads hold all of that information, some of which is not distributable to other members of the public apart from between Vic Roads and the driver because that's where their um, privacy 
confidentiality sits. So we need to ask Vic Roads to make sure that they're not aware of anything that's going to prevent this person from driving and that they're happy that the medical report that they've received meets the medical guidelines or medical you know, standards to drive. So we can't take the person, certainly not on road, without that clearance form and we don't do an off-road assessment without it either because we don't want to drag them through that if they ultimately can't drive anyway. So we wait for clearance first and then do the off and on-road assessments within a week. I'm not aware of any cases like that where people have gotten into trouble for not giving advice. It'd be hard to prove, I would have thought, but um, and, and, and I think that one day it'll possibly happen, but at the moment, no. No, but, but you know, I think you're quite right in pointing that out as a risk. It's really important to keep comprehensive notes. It's always important to remember that every, every patient you see might end up getting into some sort of trouble, whether it's on the road or doing something else, and one day those notes will end up in a courtroom. Yeah, well, certainly the person has um, the right to seek future assessments. Sometimes that is what will come out of a Vic Roads review of that person's file if they appeal a decision, is that Vic Roads will determine that potentially another assessment is required and then they would actually seek out another therapist to perform a reassessment of someone's driving. As Maureen said this morning, driving is something that can change over time. We also have to remember that the on-road assessment as extensive as we can possibly make it in a practical sense is still only a very small snippet of time. So you're looking at, you know, an hour of somebody's driving. So it might be that in that second hour they drove brilliantly and didn't run into the kind of errors that they had. It might be that something untoward happened in that first assessment and it threw the person and then they made mistakes. You, it's very, very difficult to put those two assessments together and say, well, yes, clearly on one day they didn't do well, clearly on the other day they did drive well. Was, I'm glad I don't have to decide which one of those reports stands higher in determining the licensing decision. Vic Rhodes and <laughs> Morris get to do think, that for um, us. Yeah, I think if Vic Rhodes gets, a, gets two conflicting reports from two professionals within a short period of time, whether they're OTs or doctors or whoever, they take these very, very seriously. They almost always get sent to us and we spend a bit of time on the telephone to the various people discussing this. Um, I mean, people have been known to lie and cheat and connive as far as giving histories to people. We've had people forge doctor's letters and all the rest of it. It's a bit hard to know how they can fake an OT test, but, but um, you know, almost anything's possible. So, you know, if Vic Rhodes, who's the ultimate um, respondent of all of these um, reports, if they see that there's been some some uh, difference between different professionals' opinion, they'll generally take that as a red flag to go looking into it a bit further. 